Buzz. Make no bones about it. Tonight you witness history. Oz Buzz is born. Now, there are two basic truths that we English, Poms, know about Australians. One is that we invent sports that they then regularly beat us at. <laughs> and two is that despite the pain inflicted, Therein, we know that this is the most hospitable country in the world. So thank you very much for having us here. Now, those of you who were in Vancouver two years ago may recognise that the personnel you will see tonight, responsible that the personnel who were responsible for the evening news there, uh, are indeed presenting tonight. But this is going to be very different. We do not stand still. No flies on us. <laughs> what we will do tonight is to reflect the new chapter we've reached in the evolution of the HD community, now unquestionably a global community. Most of you will be familiar with the phenomenon that is HD buzz, and if you're not, you certainly should be. It has revolutionized patient access to scientific news in a way that, no, that, that is unprecedented in any field of medicine. And I'm proud to say that I hold the title of the consulting publisher of HD Buzz. Do you know how much work I put into that publication? <laughs> Zip. <laughs> Nada. Sweet Fanny Adam. If you wrote down all of the hours that I've put into my role as consulting publisher of HD Buzz, it would be shorter than Muammar Gaddafi's social diary for next month. <laughs> But, but, rest assured, rest assured, when HD Buzz is rightly acclaimed with some sort of award from the, for, for the new boundaries that it has uh, pushed for public access to science, I will be right up there on the stage, <laughs> pushing the others aside to hold the award by no possums, my jest. The astonishing work that is HD Buzz is all down to my two co-presenters tonight, who I would like to introduce to you now. The hosts with the most, the toasts of researchers everywhere, who can boast that they are the best at telling it how it is. First, from Boston, USA, but moving again, he's always moving. They call him the buzz because he stings like a bee. Dr. Jeff Carroll, An intellectual beast, <laughs> wild at heart, <laughs> and never afraid to unsheath his sword of truth. <laughs> Dr. Ed Wild. Tenterhooks wound up like a kangaroo, as hot as a dingo on heat. <laughs> tell me, tell me, tell me, just how is Ozbuzz going to work? Well, Charles, I'm uh, delighted to announce that, like Batman and Transformers combined, we've rebooted our franchise. We're sticking with our formula of bringing the hottest science to the whole audience here, in language that hopefully everyone can understand. Uh, but this time around, rather than attempt to digest every word that's been said all day, we're uh, starting with our news headlines, featuring the stories that we think are most exciting and most relevant to the non-scientists in the audience. And I understand, Jeff, that we're going to see uh, some researchers in a different light to usual. Is that right? 
you, uh, you might have gathered from the uh, distinctive furniture over here that we've set up a, a comfortable space for scientists to uh, get comfortable, let their hair down, and talk science. Uh, we're calling it Chatlandia after uh, rejecting uh, Chatganistan and Chatmandu. Um, <laughs> you were right. Uh, so each night, Ed and I will be interviewing uh, three scientists, uh, hoping to probe behind the headlines, learn a little bit more about their work. Um, so this is for the audience in the room, this is for you guys. Um, but also, uh, we're taping this, and we're hoping to share this uh, right afterwards, we'll be uploading it, so people all over the world watching uh, an HD community who've been alerted about this happening can watch and find out about what's happening at this meeting right away. So hopefully we can reach out to the global HD community in sort of real time. Uh, we've, al we've also requested and received some questions from the HD community for these scientists directly, so hopefully we'll, we'll maintain that interactivity. Charles? And so let's get straight on then with today's news headlines and let's start with you, Jeff. Where where were you today? Uh, here at the, the, we started with the plenary session and uh, we heard from Peter Harper. Oh wait, I get to try this clicker. Nothing could possibly go wrong. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't intentional. That's a replay. Yeah, hey. <laughs> Hmm. Scientists of Monday, we feel your pain. <laughs> <laughs> can we, can Could we have the PowerPoint presentation, please, team? We're, we're quite pretty, though. We might could just... Okay. I think you'll have to imagine Peter Harper until <laughs> we get the PowerPoint up. Peter did a really fantastic job. There he is. Peter did a fantastic job highlighting some of the unique features of this community, you guys, everyone in the room. Uh, he reminded us that in many ways, uh, HD has been and continues to be uh, a pioneering effort for a lot of people suffering from other diseases. The things that we learn and forge and do are helping other people. And I think it's really all of our hope that we can be pioneers in developing treatments as well as coming together as a community. So Peter's historical uh, overview of HD very nicely set the stage for, let's try the clicker again. <laughs> yeah, it really is as hard as it looks from this morning. There we go. Oh. <laughs> Professor Sarah Tabrizi, she highlighted the large number of potential therapies that are in the clinic and really drove home the fact that in the next two years, we really should hope to see some, some novel treatments with really exciting drugs. Um, so they're exciting times, or as Sarah says, and now you all know, HD, yes we can. <laughs> Uh, then Elizabeth Aylward uh, from the University of Washington did a really nice job describing the, um, the imaging results from the brain study in PREDICT, and I think that this did a really remarkable job um, telling HD patients that what they're doing and showing up for these observational trials is really starting to help um, because she was able to show very rigorously that the, the endpoints that have been derived from, these, from this analysis and this looking at HD patients um, is providing things that we might be able to use to successfully run drug trials. Uh, in the afternoon session, we talked about animal models. Um, that's a cerebellum, not an animal. <laughs> We're all pretty used to hearing about Okay, well, what does that actually mean? That means that scientists have modified the DNA of a mouse to have a mutant copy of the Huntington gene, so somewhat like an HD patient. Um, so uh, Zhao Zhengli from Emory University brought up the fact that actually there are some interesting problems with modeling HD in mice. So there are things that scientists who work on mice, who shall remain nameless, who are not on this stage right now, uh, don't like to talk about the fact that, in fact, the neurons in a, a mouse brain of a, most mouse models of Huntington disease, they actually don't lose a lot of neurons. So neurons, the critical brain cells that die in Huntington disease and cause the symptoms, uh, in, a, in a, the brain of a late stage HD patient, there, there's thousands and thousands and millions of them that have died and gone away. And in fact, in mice, that doesn't seem to happen, and we don't know why. So the mice get sick, they have symptoms, we can look at them, but they're not losing neurons, and that's, that's kind of curious. Also, uh, most uh, people will know that in, uh, human HD patients have uh, hyperkeratic uh, movement disorder, so they have chorea, we call it. Mice don't get that, and we don't know why. So. Um, uh, these guys at Emory University are developing other models of diseases and, and other organisms like um, pigs and uh, monkeys. Um, these aren't their actual subjects. This is an artist rendition of the uh, <laughs> animal. Also, it's why Google Image is great because you can look up anything and find a picture of it. Yeah. So these models, they actually have the monkeys and the pigs that have been developed actually lose neurons, like, like human HD patients, but they have other features that don't look like HD patients. And so I think what the, the, the take-home message was that we really need to uh, use all of these models and take what we can from all of them. Charles. Thank you. Jeff. Ed, uh, where were you today? Uh, well, I uh, hung around in the uh, shared sessions this morning, and then I was in the youth and young people session this afternoon. 
And the thing that really struck me from uh, this morning was uh, Jim Gazella of uh, Harvard Medical School, who was talking about his work on genetic modifiers of Huntington's disease. So we know that um, HD is caused by a single mutation in a single gene, and we've known that since 1993. But we also know that there are big differences between, pe between individual patients that we don't understand and that can't be explained by the mutation that we know about. Things like what age someone is when the symptoms begin. And some of those are, are certainly due to other genetic differences that we haven't found yet. And that's what we call a genetic modifier. And these are important because any genetic modifier could become a really good drug target. And uh, over the years, several genetic modifiers have been reported in the scientific literature. Um, and, but what Jim has done is, is quite remarkable. He's reanalyzed all of those old data, including his own data, uh, and carefully looked at the statistics behind it. And amazingly, he found that several of the genes that we thought contributed to Huntington's disease and altered how the disease behaves uh, turn out not to be exerting the effects that we thought. For example, previously, we thought that the smaller of a person's two CAG repeat counts affected, in a mild way, the course of their HD. But reanalyzing... You know, we seem to have lost genetic modifiers, but actually major efforts are underway all around the world to look throughout the whole genome in a really systematic way for these genetic modifiers. And uh, Jim's uh, robust uh, analysis techniques will basically put us on the right footing to, to make sure that we get from those uh, studies solid and uh, important and true scientific, uh, genetic uh, modifiers. And then uh, just before lunch, um, we heard from Colin Masters, who's a local boy, made good, and an Alzheimer's disease guy. Um, and he's uh, trying to figure out what lessons that have been learned in the huge field of Alzheimer's disease might be able to help us in the HD field. Uh, and Prana Biotech, which is a local uh, biotech company, has been developing drugs that can alter how the proteins in our brains interact with metals in the brains, like copper, so atoms of copper can stick to some of the proteins, and that can have an effect on the way the proteins behave. And uh, Prana Biotech has a drug called PBT2, which affects the way the copper and the proteins interact, and it's been tested in Alzheimer's and is now lined up for a new trial in HD beginning as soon as uh, the end of this year here in Australia and in the USA. And then um, after lunch in the youth and young people session where I felt very much at home, <laughs> Mike uh, Orth from Ulm presented some fascinating results from a EuroHD network study of young people's experiences uh, in HD. And the major message that I took from that was that young people are desperate to find out more and get more support from professionals and also from each other, especially online, uh, rather than trooping into hospitals to be seen in HD clinics when they, you know, when they may feel fine. And then, as if by magic, uh, Matt mm -hmm. Ellison appeared to announce the forthcoming launch of the HD Youth Organization, HD Yo. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a site where kids and teenagers and young adults and parents and guardians will all be able to use the site to get reliable information and support for young people, by young people, backed up with a huge international panel of experts. It's launching in January 2012, and it'll be translated into several languages, and you can visit the site now at hdyo.org and sign up for email notification when it launches. And speaking as a young person, which uh, you can tell from my manner of dress and speech <laughs> and hairline, uh, I am pleased to give HDYO my thumbs up. Charles. Very good, very good. Um, well, okay, as um, the doctors make their way over to the... Um, very sexy Chatlandia. I will explain how our guests and I can win prizes. Um, Ed and uh, Jeff have taken over with them to, uh, you can hear it now, over to Chatlandia, the bell. Yes, the bell. This bell has traveled all around the world to join us here, and veterans of our past presentations will know that if anything is said that's too technical for non-researchers to understand, then they will hear this sound. Very good. 
But if they get through their interview without a bell, then they are awarded the Nobel Prize. <laughs> a rare, a rare, almost priceless HD Buzz post-it pad. <laughs> so now, to introduce our first guest, Frank Bennett is the Senior Vice President of Research at ISIS Pharmaceuticals, which is based in California. He works with several academic collaborators on something called gene silencing. There are therapies which many people talk of as one of the great hopes for us HD families. Uh, Frank is related to two US presidents on his mother's side, but more interestingly, by far, on his father's side, he's related to a famous outlaw gang called the Dalton Brothers, who specialized in bank and train robberies. He says that you can reach your own conclusions as to what happened when those gene pools mixed. Ladies and gentlemen, Frank Bennett. Hi, Frank. Nice to see you. You look good in the couch. Uh, <laughs> so today, Kick back, take your shoes off. <laughs> today, you and uh, Don Cleveland both talked about silencing Huntington. So I don't think anyone in the room needs to be convinced that getting rid of the protein that causes HD would be a good uh, therapeutic strategy. Um, but there's some confusion, even as a scientist, and I know that HD family members as well have heard about different approaches to this this therapeutic idea. Um, RNA interference is something that people hear about, or RNAi, and also I've heard of antisense or antisense oligonucleotides. Could you just briefly explain what the differences are in those approach? <laughs> With, without, of yes, course, you think, I'll just, just get ready. Right <laughs> so they're all variations on a the theme. And I, 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 I like to think of them as sort of a genus species. If you think about animal phylum and the way you organize animals, is that antisense technology is a broad approach where you're designing uh, drugs to bind to RNA. And when they bind to RNA, they modulate the function. And what dictates the difference between the different uh, antisense mechanisms that you uh, mentioned are what happens after the drug binds to the RNA. And, and they, they recruit different enzymes that are involved in the degradation of the RNA. So they're, they're, they're two different pathways to achieving the same effect inside right. the cell. Okay. That's correct. And your company, Isis Pharmaceuticals, you work with which of those? We actually work with both, but uh, the one that's been most advanced is the antisense approach that you mentioned, where we're causing uh, degradation through an enzyme that's present in cells called RNA-SH. Uh, so in, in addition to different chemistries, there's also different targets. So now we've heard um, about um, so-called specific and non-specific approaches. And, some people say allele specific or allele non-specific. Could you could you briefly explain what's the difference between those two kind of target strategies? Sure. As I think the audience is well aware, is that uh, uh, all humans or all species have two copies of a gene, and in Huntington's disease, one of the copies of the Huntington gene is uh, has a, a a change in the base composition, so that you have an expansion of a CAG repeat. Uh, whereas the other copy is a normal uh, allele uh, that's present in uh, uh, your most uh, And allele just means a, one a copy gene. of a gene, right? That's correct. No, that's okay. Well, <laughs> I'm really angling for you to get some post-it <laughs> notes. I'm really <laughs> trying to help you out. Sorry. <laughs> um, and, and so there are two approaches that we could take. One is to inhibit both copies of the gene so that we uh, 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 cause a non-allele specific inhibition of Huntington. And that means that both the normal and the, the, the CAG expanded uh, copy of the gene are, are affected. Or there's another approach that we could take. It's a little bit more complicated, but uh, it would allow us to only inhibit the uh, copy of the gene that has the uh, CAG expansion. And so at ISIS, uh, you guys are working on both of these approaches in parallel. That's correct. And you know, one's a little bit further ahead, the non-allele specific uh, uh, approach. Uh, it, as far as the, the development of that approach, it's a little bit more advanced. So I know that nobody ever wants to get ahead of themselves with timelines. I mean, this is a complicated business, and, and it's difficult to put numbers on something that's, this is not engineering, this is science, but 
do you have a sort of a qualitative sense for family members? I mean, is this something that's 20 years away, or is it something that's happening next week? Can you give us some sense of, of what you think? It's years, but it's uh, a couple of years. I, I, uh, I think it's something that we're very close to having a, a compound that's ready to start clinical trials within a couple of years from now. And, and, and the, the key test to get there is that we have to do uh, a series of animal studies to uh, evaluate the safety of the drug. And that generally takes about nine months or so to complete those uh, uh, studies. So we're hoping to start those animal studies next year. And then that would put us you know, eight, uh, a couple years out to start the human And studies. what about that? So once you get to humans, does ISIS have experience with giving these, these kinds of drugs to people? Do you know how to deliver them and how people are going to react to them once you, once you expose them to them? Yeah, so the, the focus of our company really is uh, antisense technology or RNA uh, uh, targeting therapeutics, where we're, we're targeting a variety of different uh, diseases. Uh, we have two programs in uh, neuroscience that are using a similar delivery method that we're using for the Huntington uh, drug. And so we'll learn from those programs and it'll inform the Huntington program, which we're, we're, uh, the goal would be that it would accelerate the human testing because we'll learn from our mistakes with the other program. And, and so those ones in clinical trials today in patients for ALS, which is another neurodegenerative disease, and then the other one should start later this year for uh, a childhood uh, uh, motor neuron disease called spinal muscular atrophy. That's great. Thanks very much, Frank. Sure. Well, thanks so much. So let's move on now uh, while Frank moves across the sofa a little bit to fit in our second <laughs> guest, uh, Tony Hannon. He's the associate uh, professor at the Flory Neuroscience Institute's the Melbourne Brain Center, which uh, means that he is yet another Melbourne boy who seems to have done well for himself. He works on something that I, for one, believe dispels the myth that there is nothing that gene-positive people can do about their fate, uh, how environmental and lifestyle factors can uh, influence Huntington's disease. Now, when he played rugby at college, um, Tony says he was given the names of kamikaze and the smiling assassin um, because of the nature of his tackle. Sorry, I mean tackling. He was given the name. Sorry, a little type, typing problem there. Now, for those World Congress attendees who are not familiar with rugby, by the way, you can watch, of course, almost every day the current World Cup being held in New Zealand. Tony, of course, is supporting the second best team in the tournament, Australia, uh, Tony Hannon. So, Tony, thank you very much for being a sport and uh, <laughs> hopping up there on the gold sofa. Now, um, so, <laughs> you look good, man. <laughs> Suits you. You found your niche. So, um, your talk was about environmental modifiers. Uh, and if I'm not very much mistaken, an environmental modifier is when an Australian cow farts <laughs> and, the, and the methane gas gets into the atmosphere and the polar bears melt and bad things happen. Is that right? Am I right there? That's a kind of global version okay, of environmental, so environmental modifier. Okay. <laughs> well, how, would, how would you define an environmental modifier, Tony? So essentially, all of us, including people from Huntington's families, are the product of nature and nurture, a complex interrelationship. So genes and environment. So from essentially conception onwards, we're influenced in utero and then postnatally, obviously, by more environmental factors. So the environmental modifier is anything for a disease that changes the disease uh, relative to the gene effect. So you've got genes and environment, and any modifier is an environmental factor that can either, say, delay onset or accelerate onset, and also alter progression. And um, a lot of your work in this area uh, has arisen from studies that have been done in mice, dealing with something called uh, environmental enrichment. What's meant by that? So the concept of environmental enrichment, it's relative to standard housing conditions, which for mice, our standard conditions, there's uh, groups of mice, they have unlimited food and water, they have soft bedding, they have other mice, but it's generally a bit boring. So environmental enrichment relative to that, and it varies between laboratories, but relative to that, 
It's far more novelty and complexity. It's toys. It's other objects like running wheels. So it enhances sensory stimulation, cognitive stimulation, uh, movement, and therefore enhances complex mental and physical activity. Okay, so it's basically mice that are given a much more interesting yes. environment. And what happens to HD mice when they're put in, in an environment like that? So what we found about a dozen years ago is that the ones that had environmental enrichment, these Huntington's mice that had a fragment of the human Huntington's gene with the genetic starter, the CAG repeat in their genome, that the environmental enrichment caused a delay in onset of disease relative to those that had the kind of standard boring housing environment. And it was a pretty significant delay, right? Yes, yeah. and it's been shown in other mice and And other since then, you and other people have been basically trying to figure out <coughs> what it is about having a more interesting environment causes the mice to live, to, to, have a, uh, to, to look better and suffer less from the effects of mutation. Yes. So there's a question here from uh, Victor Arothko in Colombia, um, who's read your abstract and wants to know, how is it that the factors that we know about, things like environmental enrichment, what is the mechanism for those altering the progression of Huntington's disease? I'll just get this close. <laughs> <laughs> and how do you begin to answer a question? So that's a big question, an excellent question. So there are two sides to this, and there's a whole area, and this applies not just to Huntington's families, but all of us. So all of us will eventually, if we survive heart disease or cancer or diabetes and other diseases, if we live long enough, pretty much everyone in this room will be exposed to a late life brain disorder like Alzheimer's or dementia, uh, that type of senile dementia. So there's an element whereby this environmental enrichment changes a healthy mouse that doesn't have the Huntington's mutation. And that's part of what we've been studying So and other, other groups around the world. So if you take a, a healthy mouse and you expose it to this complex environment, you can see the birth of more neurons in the adult brain from adult stem cells in, in the brain. You can see increased connections between different groups of brain cells and that's part of the effect. So you see all these in a healthy mouse. There are other subsets of changes caused by the Huntington's gene mutation that are going wrong in Huntington's, a subset of those that seem to be reversed by the stimulation. And we're not sure how, except it does get into the DNA and change the subset of genes that produce proteins, that's part of it. But it may change some of these other processes that are going wrong in the cells, in, in the brains of, of the Huntington's mice and the Huntington's patients. So there's, th there's some stuff about having an enriched environment that's generally good for brains, and some stuff that appears to be specifically good for counteracting some of the effects of the mutation in Huntington's. Absolutely, and cool. so this concept of brain reserve applies to Huntington's, but it also applies to the general population and applies to other diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's as well. So can I have a running wheel then? <laughs> <laughs> you don't look like you need one. <laughs> There's a gym at the Hilton next time. <laughs> so um, uh, to put you on the spot slightly, and a lot of people have been asking this online, is there anything that you can advise HD families and people who are at risk of the disease or who have the mutation that comes from your scientific work in terms of what they can do in their lives, their everyday lives, that might help to delay the onset or delay the progression of Huntington? So we can't yet. So a study that followed up the mouse study led by Nancy Wexler showed in the Venezuelan population that environmental factors are there. We, we know they're there and a uh, group led by Martin Della Tiki in Melbourne also did a study that showed that being more active in patients appears to delay onset, but can't say exactly what type of activities. So just like for other diseases like Alzheimer's, and there is some epidemiology, some clinical studies there, it really comes down to those studies are saying anything that with respect to the mental activity that is stimulating that involves engaging, and this, this includes social interaction. Things like social interaction are actually high level uh, mental function. So that's the, the complex mental activity side. And the other side, and physical activity, it could be lots of things. So the, the clinical studies need to be done. No one has a magic formula. But the reality is, being more mentally active and being more physically active, there's no downside. In fact, if you're more physically active, you reduce your risk of heart disease, certain cancers, diabetes, 
So if it's good for the body, it's good for the brain. So essentially, what it requires is people, rather than with the mental activity, engaging in something for days and weeks. This is a chronic disease, so it needs to be something people enjoy that they would do for years and decades to actually continue to do it. So it's very personal, and until the clinical studies are done, we won't know whether one type of mental and physical activity is really better than another, and, and it's like anything, people need to be enjoying it or, or they won't keep doing it. And to answer Michaela in Stuttgart's question, those studies which you mentioned, which those are long studies of comparing different types of people and how much exercise they do and so on, those are being set up, right? Yes. Good. <laughs> <laughs> we have to leave it there. Tony, thank you very much. Back to Charles. Great. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. I see you all getting the hang of it now with the movement on the sofa. Very good. Um, <laughs> Professor <laughs> Leslie Thompson at the University of California, Irvine, leads a team of researchers looking at how cells modify their own DNA, DNA and the mutant Huntington protein. But there are other things less well known about the uh, professor than that. Uh, she wouldn't be here tonight, she says, if she hadn't lived in Mexico as a child and learnt their Spanish, which enabled her to join Nancy Wex, though, in Venezuela. She was also a concert flautist and a triathlon competitor. And one of my sources tells me to ask her how she got sperm samples <laughs> in Venezuela <laughs> and if she still has a subscription to Playboy. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Leslie Thompson. <laughs> Leslie Thompson has left the building. I'm glad that we could keep this so professional. <laughs> so, um, you guys look really cozy. <laughs> this couch was rather smaller than we thought it would be. <laughs> Uh, Leslie, you're interested in, in, in chemical changes to the Huntington protein, and so I think, I think hopefully this audience, uh, at least from today's um, talks and others, knows that the Huntington gene makes the Huntington protein, and it's actually this protein that's the problem. Um, but you've kind of gone to the next step, and you're studying little additional chemical tags that are added to the protein. And so, just in general, why would cells do that? Like, why do they need to chemically tag a protein that they've already made? So. First of all, the, the proteins that are tagged, they, they have all sorts of different functions in the cell. And, but they're all made in the same way. They're, they're encoded in the DNA, the you make RNA, they're made into proteins. And then they have to do something. They have to go into a mitochondria. They have to go back in. Oh! <laughs> oh no. What's a mitochondria? <laughs> you can, you can, you can oh. pull it back if you explain what a mitochondria is. Okay, all right. So the energy making Bits. part of the cell. Okay, so a cell is made of protein <laughs> that it needs to get to the energy house. Right, so it will get a little tag on there or it have a little extra piece of, of protein on it and it will tell that protein to get into that part of the cell or it will tell that protein, it will cause it to interact to make to <laughs> associate with another protein in the cell. <laughs> To make friends with the other It will protein. make friends with another protein <laughs> in the cell. <laughs> so these tags will tell the protein what to do, where to go, what it's, what it's going to interact with, et cetera. So and so you guys have evidence that this, this process, not just of making the protein, but of tagging it and making it have different functions, that's, that's messed up in Huntington disease. Yes. So in some ways, it's normal um, tags will be altered. In other ways, it will have new tags that will take on a new activity that it wouldn't normally have. Yes. We got, we got through that with only one <laughs> bell. I'm pretty impressed. Yeah. <laughs> so, so not only are these tags on the protein in the cell, but as you talked about today, they're actually on the DNA. So the, the genetic information that actually encodes these proteins is tagged. Is it the same kind of tags? Are they different tags? So they are similar kinds of tags. Um, what a tag that would tell the protein, the Huntington protein, that it needs to be cleared out of the cell, go into the trash and get cleared out, will tell the DNA that it should make a particular protein or not. So our cells all have the same DNA in them, but they, because of these kinds of tags, 
um, a skin cell will make certain proteins that make it a skin cell. A heart cell will make a heart cell because of these kinds of tags that say which genes will turn, be turned off or turned on and will make specific types of proteins. So, I mean, this is all very interesting, but like, does it have a, a point for the, from a therapeutic point of view? I mean, I don't mean to say I does sure your life work so. have a point. <laughs> but, After all this time. But, but could this help HD patients? Is yes. There some, no, some it does. What, because the, the enzymes in the cell, the proteins in the cell that will put on or take off the tags, is that better? Mm. Um, those, those are become therapeutic targets. So those are, have functions that you can inhibit with a drug or activate with a drug. Mm -hmm. So we would like to either, in some cases, enhance that ability or inhibit that ability. So if you can, if you can fix this tagging and untagging of both the Huntington protein. Or at least restore it to the right balance. Because in some, it's not necessarily an all or nothing thing that you want it on or off, but you want to restore the balance to And there's, there's drugs out there that do these kinds of things then? There are some that are in existence, and in particular for cancer, um, but, and then other things that need to be developed. Well, so um, we want to go, if we can, to a, a video question from, um, from Ken Serban, who wanted to talk to you about another aspect of your work that we haven't had time to, uh, to go through yet. Do we have the, um, the video, guys? It's on the PowerPoint. Here. Greetings from San Diego <laughs> to all of the participants in the World Congress of Huntington's Disease in Melbourne. This is Gene Veritas, the gene positive blogger on Huntington's disease, AKA Ken Serban. I would like to know how much more quickly your work and the field are moving along because of stem cell research, and what are the most important discoveries that you've come upon with this stem cell research? Thank you, Dr. Thompson. Thank you to everybody for your efforts and a successful and wonderful Congress for everybody. You have 10 seconds. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Kidding. You have 11 seconds. <laughs> um, so in terms of, so we're using stem cells as a large group uh, of researchers, again, collaborative effort, to model the disease. So taking skin samples from, from people, from patients with HD and, and uh, using those in a dish in a human cell to model the disease. Now, so you reprogram them back to a very early state that they can become a heart cell, they can become a brain cell, they can become whatever. And so the thing that I think is so exciting about this is we can make them into the neurons that die in HD and study it in that way. And the, these same changes that we're talking about, these gene changes, cell death, all these other things are, showing up is different in these in this context. So does this does this speak to what Zhao Zheng Li was saying today then about cells from a mouse are different than cells yes. from humans. So you can actually grow human neurons. You can then. grow human neurons in the dish and they they are starting in Virginia Mattis actually has a poster here that describes that work of that's, the consortium. That's fantastic. I think that was 12 seconds so maybe Sorry. we better turn it back over to Charles. Thanks very much Lisa. Yeah, thank you so all thank to you. all of our guests. Well, thank you uh, to everyone over there in Chatlandia, and thank you to our special guests tonight. Um, Ed and Jeff, we will uh, see more of you tomorrow night. Um, and now to our local reporter. And my is she local. <laughs> she is more Melbourne than a tube of Fosters. She is so Melbourne that she's named after the town. Ladies and gentlemen, Mel Brimsmead. There's an old Australian stockman lying, dying. And he gets himself up on the one elbow and he says... <laughs> <laughs> that was time of... <laughs> yeah, anyway. I remember that song from, his, from being a child. You have just, just, just clippers here. Oh, excellent. So, Mel, first of all, what do we need to know about Melbourne? First of all, Charles, everyone here needs to know The Economist has recently rated Melbourne as the most world's livable city. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, Charles, it's Melbourne. Oh, M Mel, Mel. Oh. I'm having clicker issues too. 
Um, here, here we are. Mel, Mel, Mel Ben. Mel Ben. Okay. Give it another go, Charles. Mel Ben. Okay. Practically okay. local. All right. Give me, give me some things that Melbourne, Melbourne, <laughs> Melbourne has given to the world. Well, we invented. Well, not him. <laughs> he is from Melbourne. We didn't invent him. There we go. Okay. The black box and the bionic ear, both from Melbourne. Anything else? Well. You got that. We do. He's not born here, but he lives here and he won an Oscar, so we're going to claim him. Yep. Now, we've already heard this young lady this evening. Ed's favourite, Kylie. <laughs> yep. And another bloke is from Melbourne. We all love him across the world. Dear friend Rupert. Uh, <laughs> all right. And on that note of that, of uh, dear uh, Mr Murdoch there, what do we need to know about Australian culture, Mel? Well, despite how we're portrayed on tally, we're not all like Mick Dundee or Steve Irwin. We're pretty cash in Australia, pretty yep. cash. None of this pleased to me to your business. It's, g'day, how's you going? <laughs> this can be used at any time, for the first time of meeting someone or, you know, just passing someone by. Okay. Most importantly, for everyone out there, you need to know, we drink pots, not pints or schooners. So when you go to the pub tonight, order a pot of Fosters. It's the Aussie thing to do. When in Rome. Well, okay. All right. And now for our audience who might not be uh, completely fluent in Australian, uh, could you uh, give us a few key phrases um, I, that might be helpful? I can. Could all the blood nuts out there built like brick shed houses wearing thongs please stand up now? <laughs> um, no one stood up. Does that mean it needs some explaining? Well, our Prime Minister, perhaps the most famous blood nut around, she's a ginger, a ranger, a redhead. <laughs> Got the picture? <laughs> Brick shit house. <laughs> Fine specimen of a man, meaning well toned, probably someone you wouldn't want to meet in a dark alley. Or you might, you never know. <laughs> Whoa. And, yeah, that's right. In Australia, we wear our thongs on our feet. Right. Okay. Now, if the dollar gets to want to get out in their thongs uh, to get away from the conference, what can they do, Mel? Get yourself a fried dimmy with soy sauce. Perhaps don't ask what's in it. <laughs> don't forget to try Vegemite on your Sanger. Spread it on your toast or perhaps pop it in a bread with cheese. Goes all right. Footy fever's also hit Melbourne. Now, I probably won't say much about that. My team didn't make it. <laughs> Excuse me. Now, for those of you who like to explore the beach, we've got St Kilda. For coffee, scoot to De Graves Street. And if it's a touch of Egypt you're after, get to our museum. Tutankhamen. <laughs> or, if art's more your thing, head to the National Gallery or the Ian Potter Centre for some real Aussie art. Or, if you look out the window there, take a stroll down the Riara. There's a fire display on the hour, every hour. All right. And, and, and if I... Uh want to do that. I've only brought summer clothes with me because I've always seen on TV that it's always sunny in Australia, right? Charles, it's Melbourne. <laughs> Be prepared for four seasons in one day. 17 today, seven overnight. <laughs> you're going to need a rug up, Charles, especially if you're going to the Moonlight Cinema tonight. Oh, sorry, rooftop cinema. Rug up, pop on your warm clothes. You're going to freeze. 
Well, I've already rented a particularly warm, warm frock for, uh, for, for the evening. Now, I know the economist you pointed out said that uh, Melbourne is now the finest place on earth to live, but I understand that some Melbournians aren't entirely... Uh, 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 Melbournians. Melbournians aren't entirely happy, is that correct? That's right, Charles. This week in a local Melbourne newspaper, children were asked the question... I'll just get to that question. How would you like... How would you make Melbourne a better place? Now, young Lily thought, by being a Barbie or a princess and playing with lots of arts and crafts. Abdu Jabbar thought... There should be more zoos with lions in them and swimming with the sharks and dolphins that make Melbourne all right. Young Magnus, he thinks more, ma more magnets are needed. <laughs> that is, that's what will make Melbourne a better place. Well, I, I think that... He, he, we kind of wondered, what, you know, did he actually like, count how many magnets there were already and make a mathematical assessment? Thank you very much, Mel. You can go on the promise that you'll be back tomorrow night with more. I will. Oh, yeah, I, I, Okay, and now uh, for something uh, to remind you of why you are all here. Of the people who will be watching this on the net around the world, some have Huntington's now, some will have it in the future, uh, and many more watching it are the unsung heroes who care for those people. They are a breed apart, truly special people. Now, a group of teenagers from Adelaide in South Australia who have to look after relatives who have HD got together in a workshop to co-write a song about their life. And here, set to pictures of carers around the world who pray that you scientists here can help them and the people they love is the extraordinary song, Tell Someone We Care. <laughs> Pretty damned extraordinary, eh? And uh, thank you to all of the families around the world, and especially here in Australia, who provided us with those pictures. Now, I have one small uh, piece of housekeeping to do as we near the end of our uh, presentation. Alice Wexler has asked uh, the representatives of the uh, HD family organizations uh, to come to a brief informal meeting after OzBuzz here. Um, and uh, to, uh, which, the purpose of which will be to update on their activities, accomplishments, problems, and needs. And I want to just tell you an extraordinary anecdote of something that happened about two hours ago in this building, which I think speaks volumes, first of all about the reality of the prevalence of this disease, which is 
much, much greater, I think we all know, than the statistics that have been given out in the past, and also about how much we still have to do to draw people into organizations like this. Just two hours ago, in this building, Professor Alan Tobin was in the lift elevator, to be bilingual, um, of the Hilton Hotel, and uh, he saw some people who he assumed were delegates at the conference, and he said, how do you do? I'm Professor Tobin. And they realized that they were actually at a completely different conference, totally unrelated, nothing to do with this at all. And they, they said, oh, well, you know, what are you here for? And he said, well, there's a Huntington's disease conference going on here. And the, they said, well, our family's absolutely riddled with Huntington's disease, uh, but we didn't know there was any way of getting any support about it. Is there any way we can get some advice? Now, that actually happened two hours ago in this building. Incredible. So this is Ozbuzz. Buzz is premier. I hope that you will be able to join us tomorrow night and thank you, the audience in here and at home. Um, it's up because of all of you that uh, we get to have a chance of hope that we can dream of a day soon when this disease does not scare us anymore. And on that note, I will leave you with the words of an Aboriginal proverb. Those who lose dreaming are lost. Good night.